Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Megan Baydorman from Team Salon, inviting you to settle down, get comfy, and listen in to a very, very special event indeed, our literary salon with Booker Prize winner, Douglas Stewart. Now, the salon actually gave the UK premiere of Douglas's first book, Shuggy Bane, back in 2020, so it really felt extra special to be the final stop on Douglas's UK tour for his second novel, Young Mungo. And as we love to treat you, our dear podcast listeners, we wanted to share the entire evening with you. So, here's Damien and Douglas in conversation. Enjoy! Welcome, everybody! Welcome, welcome, welcome! Oh my god, I've just noticed the stage revolves. I missed like a massive Diana Ross moment. That would have been so exciting. Anybody, welcome everybody to this very special salon celebrating Douglas Stewart, who's just out there. He's going to be out. He's going to be here in a wee minute. I know it's so exciting. Um, Welcome to Brighton, to the end of the line, to the last date on a tour that has broke records and hearts across the country. He started off with Lulu and he ended up with me. Gonna point that out. Fuck Lulu. <laughs> what the fuck? No, I love Lulu. She's great. I love her show on QVC. Have you ever have you ever been drunk enough to be up late enough to see it? It's so good. It's called Lulu's Time Bomb, and she sits there rubbing endless layers of cream into her face and shouting at you to buy stuff. It's brilliant. Um, anyway, so that's where the two started. <laughs> this is where it ended, um, and I'm really excited to have you all here tonight. So thank you so much. Um, to those of you who have made the effort to come down from wherever you've come from. We've got people in tonight from Glasgow. Glasgow! (laughs) It's a long way to avoid going to Edinburgh. It really, really is. It really is. (laughs) Thank you so much. Are you having a lovely time? Did you get here earlier today? Lovely, lovely. Thank you very much for being here. Um, So I, uh, the salon premiered Shuggy Bane back in 2020. Um, and it was lockdown, and Douglas was doing his very first event for his very first book um, from his very clean white couch in upstate New York, if you ever saw any of his events. He's had a lot of weight out of that couch. Um, and there he was, doing his very first, very first event, and it was just it's one of those moments where as a writer and as a reader, you feel something really special happen. Uh, you connect with the work and you connect with the person. Um, and it was to be a long time before, before I met him, but I felt in many ways I'd met him on the page. Anyway, that night I said, uh, this will win the booker. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very satisfying. And then, um, and then young Mungo came in and I was nervous. I was nervous because I thought, you know, will this be as good? You know, you always, you always think that. It's just a one tick wonder. And, and Nicola Sturgeon tweeted, she was nervous too. Um, um, but that's, that's politics, that's not, uh, that, that's not fiction, or maybe they're the same thing. But anyway, she, she tweeted she had been nervous about it, and, um, and, you know, and she said in the end it was better, and she's absolutely right, it's an astonishing book, and I'm so excited to be able to talk to you about it with him tonight. It's set in 1992 um, in Glasgow, it's told in two separate timelines, it's about Mungo, who is Catholic, um, and James, who, wait there, no, have I got that? This is, this is terrible. I grew up getting a kicking for this my whole life, getting <laughs> it confused. And my mum would, because my mum was Catholic and my dad was Protestant, I got that bit right. My mum was Catholic and my dad was Protestant, and they used to say to me, if anybody asks you what football team you support, say Motherwell. And I was like, that's just not going to help. <laughs> you know? Or they'd be like, say, you know, I support my legs and my legs support me. And you're like, that's just going to get me another kicking. This is not helping matters, these people. Have you been out there? Anyway, so... Um, it's a world that I know, um, and it's a world that you know many people don't know, but he brings it to life. Uh, the only thing that the Catholics and the Protestants can agree on, of course, is that they hate the gays. Um, and this is a source, uh, and that's still true. Um, and it's a, a source of much of the tension that drives um, the storyline, sort of Romeo and Juliet, sharks and sharks and jets. Think of it that way. I've made it sound so much more romantic than it is, if you've ever been near an orange lodge or anything like that. But, um, <laughs> So anyway, that's, um, that's, that's approximately the setup, and the book is, at points, as dark as the deepest loch, and then it is as hopeful as only Glasgow can be when the rain stops. 
please welcome Douglas Stewart. You had me laughing backstage with the I support my legs and my legs support me. Did you get that? Because well? everybody got that, yeah. <laughs> it was I just shy, wasn't it? It didn't it work, shite. did it? No, you get kicked in, yeah. Um, now, you, you've not been back to Brighton for how long? Oh, 24 years. So, is he here? What happened? Can no. you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, it was a long weekend. No, no, no. It's been ages. It's been ages. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. we're really glad that you came tonight. I'm so delighted. Thanks for about having it. me. It's a pleasure. Look at all these lovely people. They I came know. from Glasgow. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Yes. A long way to avoid Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good line. It's a good line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, so this is the last open the tour. Tell us what it's been like, because you didn't get a book tour last time. No, I didn't. I didn't off that couch. No. Um, and so it's been amazing. You know, it was hard emotionally. Everybody had problems, so my problems aren't really big problems. But it was hard to have the book published and to be in Glasgow and to, you know, to see Shuggy out in the world and for me not to follow him. Yeah. And so my family went through a journey and I went through a different journey, but I was in New York. And, and I just wanted to meet readers. I had, I'd always had that dream since I had been writing the book that I would open it. Sucky Hall Street, The Warstones. Mm -hmm. And so it was set up for all that and then the pandemic happened and I couldn't do any of it. So I just did that uh, last week and it was amazing. And Lulu was there, you said, and the First Minister and Mary Doll from Rabsey Smith. Oh my God, uh, Elaine C. Smith. So good. All how, the big is, how big is her hair? I was like, oh my God, she's so glamorous, Elaine C. Smith in real life. She's she really was brilliant. Glamorous. And there was a queue of like 150 glass weeks and she went, sorry, I'm just cutting in. And I thought, oh, that's a bold, that's a bold woman that does that, yeah. Just pushes her way to the front. Um, and so that was, that was the start and then you've been all across the country, crisscrossed. Yeah. Everywhere. I got my very favourite question in Bath. What was that? Um, my favourite question in Bath was, I'm glad the Glaswegians are here, but um, there was a woman in the front row and she was dead excited. She was an American lady and she was kind of squirming in that and it came to question time and her hand went up and I said, oh, this is going to be good because she's excited. And she said, I'm so happy for you that Shuggy Bain's going to be translated into 38 languages. But my question is, when will it be translated into English? <gasps> <laughs> Pretty much what Bath did, I have oh to say. Oh my God. That was the noise they made, yeah. Did you bottle her? I what did, did you do to her? Because <laughs> it's a book about violence, so I mean, like, what if it's just, yeah, it, yeah, like that. See you. Yeah. See you. Yeah. Front row. That's it. Uh, no, I didn't. But it came around, we were talking about Scottish silence later, and yeah. she was an American lady, and I said, yeah, you know, Scottish people can hold a lot of silence, yeah. unlike Americans that say anything that crosses <laughs> their mind. And I just turned to her and she went, <laughs> I'm married to an American, so I'm allowed to say <laughs> that, yeah. Um, no, there'll be none of that tonight. Um, will you give us a wee reading and then we'll, we'll talk more yeah. about it? We've been laughing and now we won't be laughing. But uh, That's very Scottish to go straight from laughter to tears. It's one of my also favourite lines from Dolly Parton, laughter through tears is my favourite mixed emotion. I think she's a Glaswegian on some level, you know. So she is. just doesn't know it, yeah. <laughs> it's the eyelashes. <laughs> This is where the two young men are hanging out for the first time. They're over at James's house. Mungo meets uh, a boy called James. James's bedroom was a mess. The walls were thick with posters pinned layer upon layer. Clothes, clean and dirty, lay in heaps on the floor. In the corner of the room was a pile of old canary cages modified to transport pigeons. Above these was a twitcher's map of Scotland, lochs and hillsides in glorious detail each glen filled in with a type of bird an enthusiast could expect to find there. James had circled some flower-flung places to disappear to. The boys lay together, with James facing upwards and Mungo with his head at James's feet, head to toe in the single bed. They took great pains not to touch. If one moved his leg too close, the other shifted and hung off the side of the narrow mattress. What's your ma like? asked James in the darkness. It was hard to describe such a thing, you only got one, mother. It didn't bear a comparison, and she didn't come with a list of features like a new oven. I don't know. She's just my ma. Mungo had never considered it before. He could hear James picking an old sticker from his headboard. Would well, does she like to dance? Aye. Does she like to sing? More so when she's drunk. Mungo's eyes were open in the darkness. The room looked strange and somehow familiar. 
He would have thought a Catholic's bedroom would have been bare or perhaps crucifixes everywhere, <laughs> but there were none. He kept expecting to roll over and see Hamish eating cereal in his bed. My sister says she's not a mother at all. She says we were just a mistake that happened to a stupid young lassie and that she's regretted it ever since. After my dad died, Momo decided she was going to put herself first. That's not what mammies are supposed to do. Well, that's another thing Jodie says. Mungo didn't want to talk about them anymore. What was yours like? Oh, she was the business, James said it very quickly. Even when she was really sick, she pretended like she wasn't. Any. Every day I came home from school, she wouldn't let me get out of her hug until I told her everything that had happened. If Geraldine got home after me, she had to wait in line for her hug. It could take pure ages. My mummy called it the juicing. She said if she didn't hold us tight, we would ignore her. So she squeezed as hard as she could to get all of the good stuff out of us. She wouldn't let us go until you tell her absolutely everything. That sounds nice. Aye, it was. James coughed like there was a clog in his throat and Mungo could tell he was breathing deeply to keep himself from crying. Mungo didn't know what to do. He reached out a hand and felt the sharpness of James's shin bone. He made a fist and tapped along the bone, up and down, up and down, the way a doctor would probe a fracture. He waited for James to pull away, but he didn't, and Mungo folded first. He drew back his hand, and he laid it in the centre of his chest. Thank you. We were all like, don't stop reading also, where's the hand going to go next? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's just, it's just a, a moment of real beauty in the book and real tenderness. And it's really erotic and innocent and beautiful. And I just, I love the way that they fall in love. And yeah. I love you for writing it because it's Thank so you. rarely depicted in yeah. fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so Mungo talks about his family there. And I thought we'd start off by talking about Mungo and his family. Yeah. And it seems to me like an, a family that's really familiar in a way, but it's, it's a family where nobody is performing the role that they were born into. Mm -hmm. So you've got a mother who likes to kid on that she's a big sister, mm -hmm. lots of makeup there, mm -hmm. or more. more. Uh, you've got a father who's a ghost, mm -hmm. you've got a brother who's a father, mm -hmm. and you've got a, a sister who's a mother. That's right. And then you've got Mungo who is, who is what? He's sort of saint to them all yeah. somehow and, and lost it. So I wonder if you could start off by talking about that family, those yeah. roles. <laughs> What Mungo is, is he's not grown up fast enough for them. And they're all keen for him to man up and to become a man and to get on with it. But yeah, his, his mother is called Maureen and she's a rascal. She's a, a, a young mother and she's very wayward. She's raised her three kids. They're only 18 to 15. They're very close in age, but she's ready to get back out there and live her life. And so she disappears for a lot of the book. And some of it seems quite comedic and a lot of it's quite tragic, mm. but she just always ups and leaves. She's looking for a party. She's looking uh, to be for chasing a, a new man. For a man. She's We're all for looking man. for a man. We've all done it. But, um, <laughs> but Mungo is the youngest of three siblings and Hamish is his eldest brother. But Hamish is uh, a young man that's already traded in his future. He's, he's quite a, a short man. You know, he's five foot two. He's got thick Coke bottle glasses and he can't quite see his future. So he's the leader of the local gang, the local young team. And is, it, is it in your words or in the words of Mung or Mungo and his pals, he's a specky wee cunt? <laughs> is it the fact, the actual words? Yeah. Um, you won't get yeah. those words in Bath. You don't get um, those words uh, in Bath, but, yeah. But, yeah. But, but, but that's, that's only, only when you ask questions like that, <laughs> you do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But so that's what he, and he's, that, he's terrifying. He's a really scary character. He's, he's terrifying. He's I wanted really to, yeah. I think other characters in the book think of him as quite weak or quite, uh -huh. you know, he isn't powerful because he's quite a short guy uh -huh. and he's terrifying. He goes to violence. He has a tick almost that violences his answer. Uh -huh. They're all, all the kids are quite emotionally repressed. They don't get to say and express themselves as they should. And Hamish's tick is that he goes to violence right away. Mm. But Jodie is the middle kid and she is so bright and capable and she's gonna go anywhere in the world. She's got this wonderful mind, but she is so sick of raising her younger brother. She reminds me of all the girls that I grew up around that no matter where they fell in the family, if they had brothers, they somehow had to look after them. Mm. And she's just had to do that because Maureen's, you know, Maureen's a rascal. And so she just wants Mungo to grow up so she can get on with her life. And, mm -hmm. and she's gonna have a decision about, you know, is she going to leave her family behind in order to, to get on? And her emotional sort of tick is that she laughs at the worst times. She's yeah. got this real nervous laughter because she can never say really what she's feeling because she doesn't get rewarded for it. Mm. 
And then there's Mungo. And Mungo is just dead ordinary. He's a 15 year old lad, he's about to be 16. And he's, you know, he's a good looking lad, but he's quiet. He was named after the saint because his mother thought it would bring some peace to some fractures in the family and in the community. And he's a very kind young man, but he's always been asked to man up and become more masculine mm. and fight with his brother and have chase lassies and all that. And it's just not in him. I remember those words and when I saw them spoken on the page, this idea of man up, which is, yeah. it's just so absolutely fucking terrifying, isn't it? Because it's just, you, it, you know it's always going to precede some kind of corrective measure, which is usually violence, mm -hmm. um, repression, mm -hmm. oppression, all of the rest of it. And, you know, I, I, I heard those words and I'm sure they're, they're words that, that you heard too. All the time, yeah. And actually, I think, it, you know, you and I are gay men, but I think it was hard for straight men as well. Because mm -hmm. I think they weren't even allowed to be outside of that. If you, you know, you couldn't like the Smiths because they were too gay, you know. Yeah. You might not like the Smiths, but you couldn't, you know, or poetry or other things. You had to be this very certain type of man that was sort of hard working, hard fighting, hard loving, hard drinking. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you had to love football, you had to love chasing girls. and. And everybody, even the women in Mungo's life, ask him to man up. They ask him mm. to be violent. They ask him to be strong, to be hard, to be tough. Mm. And some men, you know, it's just not in us. And so we're performing it. And I was always performing my masculinity as, as a young man because I was so desperate to fit in. And how, how are you doing it? Uh, I spent a lot of time chasing girls. And I knew I had no interest in it by the time I was 14, 15. I mean, they were lovely girls, but like, I just wasn't interested. And actually, I ran a lot with the scheme gangs, so mm -hmm. we got into a lot of mischief. We, we, we had nothing else to do, so we were forever wrecking stuff, we were forever starting fights, we were forever in trouble. And I was the young man that would try to be close enough to it to get a participation medal, mm -hmm. but far enough back because I was a shite bag. Mm -hmm. And so like, there was always there was like a real sort of like, you had to be in the zone, but not, not so close. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it because I just wanted to fight in, fit in, you know? We would, I grew up in, I went to a non-DOM school and we grew up You have to explain that to people who are from oh, England. okay. Um, so a non-denominational school is a school for? I mean, I would say it's mostly a school for Protestants or for very secular Catholics, but mostly for Protestants. There was never any Catholics that were Wasn't school. there? Would you say Catholics at your non-denominational school? There may have been a couple of surreptitious ones or lapse ones. Right. I mean, I would tell you that, that you know, surreptitious Catholics, you've got to keep your eyes yeah. on them. In, in their, uh, in yeah, their exactly. holes, exactly. paying for room. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm the son of a single mother and my mother was devoutly Catholic, my whole family was, and I went to a non-dom school. And so in a way I was never Protestant, I was probably more Catholic if you looked at my family. Were you um, confirmed? Did no, you I wasn't. You didn't do any of that? I wasn't confirmed because my mum... Because you had a single mum? I had a single mum who had addiction, and I think she felt very rejected by the church, mm. or very judged by the women that went to mm. the chapel. And so I was sort of just, I was like a wane that fell between two beds, you know, and nobody really claimed me. Mm. And so non-denom for me was, you know, I couldn't go to Catholic school, so I went to Protestant school. But we would fight the Catholics, and we had no idea why. And Hamish, we had no idea why. And you know, you do it, and then you go home with your Catholic mother, you know? <laughs> and it was, it, it made no sense at all. And Hamish, Mungo asks Hamish in the book, he says, why are we doing this? They have a pitch battle, you know, and there's lots of young teams or scheme gangs that just fight, and it's not about religion, but there's some in the very close east end of Glasgow where it does become, religion's another reason to divide yourself. It's a, it's a minute division. And his brother says, you know, it's about reputation, it's about respect, and he just says, and it's fucking fun. Mm. You know, it's something to do. And I think that was a lot of it. We needed something to do, you know. Mm. There, wasn't, there wasn't any amenities where we grew up. There wasn't swimming pools. We weren't going to the library. There wasn't a community centre. And so a Rami, you know, a, a bottle of Buckfast and a Rami on a Saturday night was something to do. You, you described the, that Hamish saying it's fun and then there's, the, there's that sort of joyful violence mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that you describe in the book and the, and the scene where they, the boys get together and they, so the first scene of real violence in the book, they get together and they wreck a builder's yard, mm -hmm. like they break in and they just throw stuff everywhere. It's not like they're stealing stuff, they're just absolutely wrecking it. The police turn up and then, you know, uh, somebody falls off a roof, some, the pl a policeman gets his face bricked in and I was just like, that sounds so much fun. Yeah. Because, because the thing is, I had I'd forgotten. This is tr it's very true. 
I'd forgotten that I had enjoyed that oh, as yeah. a teenager because yeah. I grew up in exactly the same sort of place. That's there right. was nothing to do, yeah. and all we did was cause trouble. Yeah, you know, and make other people's lives a misery. We were absolute neds. Yeah. Um. And um, but it, but it, but what you capture, and I think again, it's something that I haven't seen captured in fiction before. Is is the is the joy particularly that there is in a sort of a sort of destruction and it's like it's kind of vengeful um, and it doesn't leave people feeling good afterwards yeah. I mean That's you right. know uh, Mungo feels shame so yeah. that's one of the most striking incidents of shame actually yeah. early on in the book but the others don't feel shame I thought that was a really interesting characterization yeah th there was no purpose to it you yeah. were we almost were angry that people could own things and we didn't uh -huh. own anything it was about self-worth I think mm. and about recreation but yeah, we used to get into all kinds of shenanigans, and I just thought, I thought everybody grew up like that. I thought that was part of coming of age, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, a lot of what happens in the book is older lads instigate it or they lead it, and young boys are kind of swept along in it. There's a, mm. even that scene where there's the where there's the fight where you know the lads are actually building dens or doing something super constructive and recreational, and the older lads want to go fight. And the, the younger boys just sort of have to follow along. Mm. And sometimes that's masculinity, right? Mm. You follow the alpha, you, f you fit in with a tribe, you just, you go along. And, and so that was, yeah, that was what it was about. Um, as well as the, the sort of trying to fit in with the, the scheme, with the tribes around you, yeah. what was your role in, in, the, in your family when you were growing up? Uh, I mean, I had a really weird upbringing, right? It was, it was strange because First of all, just if you grow up with addiction, you become a caregiver as a kid. Mm -hmm. You really do. And you become also, because I had a single mum, I was her son and I was also her confidant and I was her, sometimes I was a doormat. I was all these different things to my mum, you know. And we had a very, it wasn't really a parent-child relationship because I knew the most intimate stories about her and all the, her problems and she would tell me about her money worries and all this other stuff. So I never really got to feel that parent relationship. Mm -hmm. But then also because my siblings were older than me, they had to step in at times and parent me. And so in a way, I was their kid at times. Mm. But then I was also their burden. You know, I, I, I remember that feeling very acutely of where I just knew it wasn't, you know, they wanted to get on with their own lives. They had to get out and start dating and do their thing. But they always had to look after me. They always had to make sure I was fed and all that stuff. So I had a family that was very dysfunctional. I mean, loving, lo a lot of love. Um, and a lot of togetherness, but it just nothing quite worked as it was. Mm. And so my role in the family, I don't know what it was, it changed all the time. Mm. Um, the one thing I never was, was the baby in a way. Mm. Uh, I was never allowed to just be myself as an individual, I think. To be a child. To be a child, yeah. yeah. It was very fleeting. It would happen in periods, you know, when things were all right and there wasn't any drink in the house, but it would never last. It mm. would never last. And it was, it was always, uh, that was part of the particular terror of addiction because you never knew what you were coming home to. You could have three good days or four good weeks or it could be, and you could come home and actually the drinking, you'll know coming from Scotland, sometimes when you get together and you drink too much, it's a party, it's a great time. Mm. And there's a terror in that too, right? Mm. Because the other times it can become really terrifying, really sad. Your mum can be trying to hurt herself, there could be someone that wants to hurt her in the house. And as a kid, you have no control over it and you've got to reckon with whatever the situation is when you come home and you can leave in the morning and come home at lunchtime and everything's changed. Mm -hmm. Or you can come home at lunchtime, everything's fine. You come home after school, everything's changed. Mm -hmm. And so that like just makes you really observant and, uh, and super anxious. Um, you describe Mungo there, observant and super anxious. Yeah. Uh, he, there's a bit early on in the book where he says uh, he really likes watching people, but he particularly likes it when he, they don't know that they're being watched. Yeah. Um, and this uh, is something also that, that Shuggy uh, has a, a quality as well of, of liking to look and when he goes mm -hmm. out in the cab with his dad at night one of the things he loves about it is that mm -hmm. he can see a different place see different That's stories right. or because right. you know Glasgow is just a city full of unemployed actors essentially <laughs> most of the time and, and Shuggy's out there seeing these, these, these stories and, and it's the same for Mungo and that that watchfulness and sense of exteriority it's kind of a hallmark of being a writer does it make us a writer did it make us writers or is it something that we used because we became writers I'm never quite sure of that yeah that's a great question I mean I think if you're going to spend your life observing you might as well use it for something yeah because uh, it's, it's kind of it was forced upon me I think not only just by what was happening at home but you're right the thing about growing up in a council estate is you have to reckon with everybody every moment of the day oh, yeah. I would have loved that experience of like having a house with a garden and you come out and you get in a car and you go to an office and you can be an individual for a wee minute, mm -hmm. you know.
But you come out of a tenement close and you've got to like get on with the neighbours. Like you're in their lives the minute you come over the door and they know everything about your life. Mm. And so that feeling that Mungo has in the book, I tried to transfer that. He's Even when he's walking around the East End, he can never just, he's always thinking about how do I walk? How do I carry myself? Mm. What are they thinking about me? Because he's aware that there's always somebody at a, a window and that, you know, the, the streets around Duke Street, the streets up by Alexander Parade, they're really narrow. Mm. They can feel really sort of constricting mm. and you're just never unobserved. Yeah, there's no privacy. Everybody everybody knows your business. That's right. Um, uh, my my granny used to do the uh, the chapel hall, obviously very Catholic, buried in a nun's habit. Um, Was she? Um, yeah, buried in a nun's habit. And she paid for loads of prayers to be said after her death um, in Africa because it was cheaper. She was trying to get on the guest list when she got to heaven. She, she was, was like, she, she was, was dressed. When the Pope came to Glasgow, she did her skirting boards just in case. You know, was, she, was, she, was, she was like that. But I was only, I was only telling you about her because uh, she, the, the observing thing, she, yeah. she was at the chapel hall, devout Catholic, um, but she used to clean the, clean the chapel hall. And she actually moved house so that she could see, she used to live to the side of the hall. She moved house so she could see the front door of the hall so she could see who was coming and going. Oh, and if you went to visit her, she'd be like, oh, that's him. He goes to the Alcoholics Anonymous. And you're like, you're not supposed to tell me that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and she, but she kind of knew everybody's business. And I think this is one of the things that you capture brilliantly in Shuggy and in Young Mung Mungo is that kind of incredible uh, street life that, mm -hmm. that, that these places have, that these working class communities have. It's good and it's bad. Yeah. Um, and you're really good at capturing the humour in it. And I just think that that's absolutely, I mean, again, it's an extremely Glasgow characteristic. This book couldn't happen in Edinburgh. Not to say there's not poverty and violence in Edinburgh, there's just no humour. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> There's your quote for the night. Is, yeah. that, the, is that, oh, who is that the Edinburgh people? <laughs> that, that's morning side of it. No, yeah. no but it is, it's, it's just, it couldn't happen in Glas uh, anywhere other than Glasgow, could it? I don't it's, think it's so. True, yeah. It's true, really. I mean, it's talk yeah. about site-specific psychogeography, yeah. that's there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think you're right about the humour. I always love that, that saying that you have more fun at a Glaswegian funeral than an Edinburgh wedding. It's so true. And, uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we're, we're not going to rip on Edinburgh, but but I, I love how Glaswegians. I mean, part of it is is you had to take the circumstances as they were flung at you, uh -huh. and there could be like enormous sadness, enormous tragedy, uh -huh. and then humour. Glaswegians have this ability to turn any situation around with a sense of humour and a sense of compassion. Mm. But I always found it a place of like extreme solidarity, and then also these really weird divisions. Mm. You know, these really subtle things. And you could have this tenderness and violence at the same time, you mm. know? It, you, sometimes you only ever felt like you belonged in your community, but then the community could be violent towards you. You mm. could feel a bit sort of under threat there. You know, I didn't see the West End of Glasgow till I was about 19. Is that right? That's right. We grew up about seven miles apart, Damien and yeah. I, and we're the exact same age. Um, I'm a little younger. Um, <laughs> a couple of months. A couple of months. Uh, no, I'm older. Oh my God, I'm older. You're Wait, younger. You were, you were born I'm me. First. Wait, I am older. I'm older no, than that's, you. I can't work the maths out on that. No, anyway. that's, we're we're both using Lulu's time bomb, as you can tell. <laughs> it's going well. But I'm um, sorry, I am. I think I'm a month older. Anyway. Um, but we grew up very close to each other. We did, but I never saw the West End of Glasgow. Glasgow's a hugely diverse city. It has mm -hmm. some extreme wealth. It has a huge middle class. It has the oldest universities in the country amongst them. Some amazing culture. Never saw a bit of it. And it was actually only when I went to college and I started to meet English students or or people from Edinburgh, or people from, well, I'd say, where do you like to go on the weekend? And they'd say, oh, we go up the West End, we love it, we love doing this. And I was so angry at first, right, because I felt cheated, because I didn't know my own city, because I only mm. knew the schemes I lived on. Mm. Um, and I had to go and discover it. And that was the same with What home. was it like when you went for the first time? Did you go on your own, or did you go with somebody? I went on a Saturday. I actually went to college in Gallish Hills, and I remember getting a bus up from Gallish Hills just to walk around Glasgow by myself. Right. And so I had to come all the way back to my home city and just spent the time and I ended up like blowing my student grant on stupid like mugs in gift shops in the West End mm -hmm. because I was actually so desperate to like have a psychological reason to be there because I didn't know how to walk along and like think oh architecture and mm -hmm. have a bit of lunch and I felt I had to buy my permission to be in the neighborhood yeah, I don't I know if you've ever that. done that yeah. if you've ever gone to a museum or something you thought I've got to get something from the gift shop otherwise I'm just stealing by yeah. looking at art yeah. um, and so I bought like all these stupid things um, and that was a thing, and I mean, that's a thing that haunts Mungo in the book as well, yeah. because part of the story takes place in the north of Scotland, mm -hmm. and he's an inner city kid that goes, he actually doesn't know where he is, it's about disorientation, this timeline, and, you know, he could be on the other side of a hill to Glasgow, or he could be 100 miles away, 
but he doesn't know how to look at the wilderness. You know, he goes through this dell and he's seeing flowers and he doesn't know what the flowers are called. So he calls one, a, you know, a lady's bum hole and he calls another <laughs> one a blue grand a willy and just all these things. He's just like, that's what it looks like to him, mm. you know. Um, it's all about blue and saggy, I suppose. Yeah. Be probably a bluebell. Um, but anyway, he doesn't know. And, and I had that feeling as a kid. We went, when I, the first time I went to the Scottish countryside, probably about 15, 16, and my brother had an orange Capri, Damien. Well, that is sexy. It was so sexy. I'm actually in the market for an orange Capri. I would have a silver one. one. I'd like a silver one with just enough rust. Would you? Like a really sleazy silver one. Yeah, yeah. It's such a sexy car. Which is weird, I shouldn't say my brother had a car and I found it sexy. But anyway, we went camping. We, went, we were going to go spend the night in the countryside, see it for ourselves. Who boys from the East End? And we went up and I remember how he, like, we could have gone anywhere. And we went, you know, maybe 40 miles outside the city. And he pulled over in a lay-by and he took a tent out the back of the car and he pitched it next to the lay-by. Oh, Jesus. We could have gone to a loch, we could have gone to a forest, <laughs> we could have gone up a hillside, but we didn't know what to do. Uh -oh. And that was the thing. We didn't know how to appreciate it and all yeah. that. And so that always stuck with me. But you've no vocabulary for that. Um, and also appreciation is a feminine quality. It's going to get you a kick in if you start talking about bluebells. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I think that you're... We weren't socialised in that way, and I think it's interesting. It's not to say work, those working class cultures and communities don't have an appreciation of beauty. There's a great learnedness. The, yeah. the the colleges and the univers the colleges that went along with the manual trades. I remember my my, my grandpa who had been a miner and a steelworker went and you know did history of art in his in his evening classes. So Amazing. there's all of that there, but just the kind of the day on the day to day. You know that's discouraged, particularly you know, particularly for a boy. So you don't have the the language for it. I I didn't go to the West End of Glasgow until I was until I'd moved out of Scotland and, and mm -hmm. gone back. I didn't know really that it existed. And I think what, you know, it's, again, it's something that you write about in, in both books, but it's particularly an issue for Jodie mm -hmm. um, because she, she wants to go there, she wants to go. Um, but she's scared to go there. And she's actually told by teachers and other people in her life, it's not for the likes of you. Yeah. It's not for the likes of that's you. That's right, yeah. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a message that runs through the book and on a number of different levels, partly class, mm -hmm. partly gender. You yeah. explore both of those. That's right. And she's she's in a weird relationship with a school teacher who's mm -hmm. obviously a very well-to-do middle-class man. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to rile up these kids in the East End of Glasgow. And and he uh, he positions himself as a Marxist. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids said, I saw him eating a kiwi fruit. Mm -hmm. can't, he be a, can't he be a Marxist? And But, but Jody, he, he was spotted with a kiwi fruit, so he was outed. His, uh, his illusions came apart. But... Um, but Jodie, yeah, even her brothers are like, don't. that's not for you. You don't belong there. Uh -huh. And she can go anywhere. She could run a country. She's yeah. so capable as, yeah, she's as so a character. Clever. She's so clever. And and so she has to feel that earned right. Like She has to like come into that. And all the characters in the book in the Hamilton family are on the edge of a new future. Mm -hmm. Something's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. And Jodie's mm -hmm. is, will she make it? Will she, will like, she get, get to education? Yeah. And in a way, she's a bit like Leek Bain like that. Uh -huh. And then she's also like Jude Foley. I think that's a thing that always haunts working class people, I think it's hard for us to think about four years in the future and mm. be like, I, I can see a plan for myself when you have to worry about today. Yeah. And it's also, you know, it's just, it's still difficult today. We think it's mm. gotten easier. It's, it's really hard. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I think right now, um, you know, the, the point you make just then is great. Four years ahead, how are you thinking about that when you're thinking how long is this electricity card going to last mm -hmm. in the near, you know, uh, am I going to get evicted next month? It's incredibly hard to develop a different time frame for your life when you're stuck in a present that's, that's right. often quite traumatic. Darren McGarvey writes about it brilliantly in Poverty Safari. He does. Um, and there's a great scene in that memoir where he, he talks about going to the West End for the first time because he has to go there for therapy. Do you remember that bit? <laughs> no. He, he has to go there for therapy and he goes to the West End and he's like, who the fuck are all these people? And, and, he, re and he sees people moving away from him because yeah. he realises he's brought this kind of anger yeah. you know, and, and resentment yeah. with him. And I think that's very natural. Um, I want to talk about the, the city and country aspect of it. Uh, the, the other timeline is that Mungo is sent away uh, on a, a fishing trip uh, with these two men, uh, and this is to make him man up. Uh, and there'll be no spoilers at all, so you can relax. Um, but he's sent away on this, on this, on this fishing trip, um, and he, as you say, he goes into the country, and it's sort of, you know, we, uh, I made a film last year about Water Scott, and it's this idea that Scotland is this country of great beauty, noble, mm -hmm. kind of almost savage beauty. It gets there, and all he can think to say is, is the lock is bigger than his scheme. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's that's, that's what his he context, that's yeah. what he compares Absolutely. it to. That that that's his life. Um, 
but tell us about that trip and, and how, how it comes about. And what I want to know, without giving away what happens on it, is did you know what was going to happen on it when you started writing about it? Yeah, that was, that was actually the, the part of the book that everything hung off of. Right. Because I knew, I didn't know what would happen at the very end. I didn't know how Mungo would resolve his situation. Uh -huh. But I knew why he was going to the countryside right. and, and what would happen. But he goes to the north of Scotland. Like I said, he doesn't really know where it is. And he goes with these two men. Uh, one's an older gentleman. He's a bit of a Glaswegian, you know, you know, he's, in, he's fallen on hard times. That's St. Christopher. That's St. Christopher. Yeah, he's called St. Christopher. His name is really Christopher. We don't know his family name because he is a member of the AA. And so he's hanging on to the rule of anonymity. And so he's known actually as Sunday Thursday Christopher because the days that the other characters see him at meetings is on a Sunday and Thursday. And he's turned it into, he likes the sound of it, he turned it into St. Christopher, S.T. Christopher. And uh, he's far from a saintly man, you know. He's a bit of a comic character. But he's shown up on this hillside with one suit and a pair of shoes that are cutting his feet. Mm. And they're going to camp this weekend. And then there's a younger man that goes with Mungo called Gallogate. Gallogate's a neighbourhood in the east end of Glasgow. And he's known of that because of AA. And he's just known as Gus that comes from the Gallogate. So now he's known as Gallogate. But he's a young, handsome, muscly young man that turns up in head-to-toe Italian denim. And I set all the characters out into the wilderness, you know, and they're wearing slippy shoes, they're wearing shorts, they're freezing, they're wet, they're too hot, they're, mm. they're like, they're just not prepared for it. Mm. And they get to this lock side with a, like two bags of carry out and a dilapidated tent. Mm. And they're like, here we are, we're going to fish. Um, and I was just thinking about like, how unprepared I was when I first came to the wilderness. And but also, you know, you're right, Scottish writers often romanticise the Scottish countryside. You know, I'll never win a Nan Shepherd Award, Damien, she'll never give it to me. Yeah. Because I see the wilderness and I just see terror sometimes. Yeah. I see, like, expanse and I see, you know, places to drown and, like, cliffs to fall off of. And uh, that's how my mind works. <laughs> and so they have, a, they have a hell of a weekend. Yeah. I mean, it's... The quote for the book that you see on the posters, it's lovely to see books on a poster, and the quote that, that you see, and I sort of remember seeing it, um, and then thinking back to who says that quote, mm -hmm. and why, when they say that quote, and being absolutely chilled to the bone. It's a, it's a terrifying sequence, and that, that descent, and, the, and what happens out there is, is, is genuinely chilling. And of course it happens because, you know, they are far away, they are, yeah. un they are unobserved, but many terrible things are also happening um, at home. A, yeah. at home. You know? They describe it as as near to heaven as you can get on three corporation buses, yeah. and that's yeah. that's where they go. Yeah, yeah. Um, they are also the, the the sorry. Just wanted to go back a sec and talk about Mungo's name, because yeah. this is really important and it's something that I understood on the reread. So people might not know about Saint Mungo and the fish, mm -hmm. the bell, the tree, and the the fish, the, the robin, the robin. That's the, the bird. Oh, the bird. The yeah. bird. Yeah, the fish. The bird. Do you want to talk about why you chose that name for them? Yeah, religious imagery is always important to me. Like Agnes was named after St. Agnes of Rome, mm -hmm. and I didn't know she was going to be called that. But I named the character, or his mother named him Mungo, because he's meant to unify some rifts in the family. But he's named after St. Mungo, who's the patron saint of Glasgow, who is so beloved. But he's beloved because he's an incredibly gentle soul. He's almost like a nursery rhyme, I think, mm. for Glaswegian kids. He does these small, they're quite small miracles, actually. He brings a bird back to life, he makes a bell ring that didn't have a clapper, he finds a ring that a woman who was having an affair loses, and he does... In the fish of her mouth. In, in, in the mouth of a fish. And then he uh, does a tree, he puts a tree out on fire, I forget what he does with the tree. Starts a tree on fire. Starts a tree on it. fire. But they're, they're like quite innocent miracles, and I, you know, that is a imagery that follows Mungo through, because he has dealings with birds and fish. So and they all ha this is what I realised yeah. at the end, they all happen, and then yeah. there's a bell, I won't say when, but there's a right. bell right towards the end. That's right, that's right. Did and you backstitch that, or did you write it at the time? No, it was, it, um, no, it came at the time, and yeah. I had to sort of keep sort of thinking about it and where it was going, because yeah. Mungo, James, that Mungo falls in love with, uh, has a ducat, which we can talk about, but he's raising pigeons on some council land, and I was thinking about how they took care of those birds and, and St. Mungo, and then the fishing and all the other stuff, but then St. Christopher has some problem with rivers, you know, yeah. and that was yeah. also a use of uh, religious myth. Um, it's interesting to me that religious imagery and myth are important to you, but you weren't you weren't confirmed. Were you religious as a, as a child? As, did you find religion as an adult, or is it just the is it just the imagery that attracts you? I think, like most gay men, I'm always fascinated by things that have excluded me uh -huh. or things that have oppressed me, mm -hmm. and you know, so I 
don't have a deep love for it, but I'm always curious about why everyone else loves it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's always kept me coming back to it. Right. And it's a story, you know, that's the thing about the miracles or the martyrdoms, mm. they are stories. Mm. And so I think about them and, you know, Agnes Bain, or St. Agnes of Rome was a, was a young woman who someone wanted to marry her. She said, I don't want to marry you. This is, I'm going to be independent. And so the men denounced her and then they dragged her through the streets and they were going to call her a Catholic. And then they decided they're going to set about her and God covers her with a cocoon of hair. And the men think, the men can't get at her, right? They can't defile her. And the men think, well, we'll not be outdone by that. God's not going to stop us. Mm -hmm. And so they set fire to her. Mm -hmm. You know, they keep coming back with ways to innovate and to destroy her. They're so determined to destroy this girl. Mm. Um, and when I was thinking about Agnes and all the, all the harm she suffers at the hands of men and how the men really shape her life, I thought, God, that's, that's so like that. Mm. And so I use that as an inspiration. Yes, I, I got that after a wee while when I was reading it. I had to think back to my granny and her saints. And yeah. I, I remembered that particular one. They are great stories and they are a good wellspring of inspiration right. all yeah. the time. Earlier on, we were talking about violence and um, you said um, that often it preceded a kind of tenderness. Mm -hmm. And as I, it's something I remember, but I, I was reading and rereading and, and expecting tenderness after violence. It didn't, didn't always happen. Mm -hmm. um, but it got me thinking about where, where it comes from, mm -hmm. you know, and why we grew up in a place in a time that was so massively violent, where violence was a way of communicating. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I started to think about the other people on the close. I started mm -hmm. to think about Mrs. Campbell, mm -hmm. um, who's this wonderful, kind woman. Yeah. Um, and I started to think about about Czech, about uh, yeah. about the other other person there, and about Thatcher. Mm -hmm. um, I promise you, there is a question in here. Um, <laughs> but it's this idea that Thatcher cre visited a gigantic act of violence yeah. upon a community, upon a city, on several. Yeah. Uh, um, but w the one that we're talking about, but that particular one. I think most lasciviously, yeah. Um, and this great act of violence visited on the community. The violence has to go somewhere. I was. It's like E M E equals M C squared. It That's becomes right. these many small acts That's right. of private violence. Yeah. Um, and it was the first time reading your book that I made that connection properly. Oh well, thank you. Yeah, and emotions have to go somewhere. Yeah. And often with men, we don't allow them to have a full spectrum of emotion. We don't say you can be vulnerable or happy or joyous or romantic or these things. And mm. and what we do say to them is you can be tougher and you can be harder and you can be violent. We, mm. we expect that from mm. men and we excuse it. But you know, a lot of the violence that also happens in the book is between Mungo and James. They mm. can't be intimate with each other until they first roughhouse or they twist each other or they wrestle. And is that not why sports are so popular? Sometimes like violence is the only way that men can touch each other, uh -huh. you know, and be close to each other and hug or be, you know, we don't allow them just to show in Britain anyway, or we certainly didn't, to just be tender with one another, to, mm. you know, to be friends in that way. And it's, I remember that as a boy, I remember how we would love to like slam our bodies into one another, you know, and for me it was thrilling, <laughs> but for them, they were playing sports and you know, and I'm sort of chasing them, I'm like, let's do that bit again. <laughs> never Tackle mind. me again, yeah, I'm never mind the ball. Yeah, 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 put all your body weight on me, I, I don't mind, honestly, yeah, but, uh, but it was true, it was the only way that, um, even in a family sometimes, the only yeah. way that older men could touch sons or that, you know, was playing sports or well done and and all that stuff and so the boys have no map I don't know what it was like for you growing up gay but they have nothing to look at in order to say this is how two men can be tender together mm. also this is how gay sex works there's no one to ask yeah. and so they're kind of fumbling you know they're they're really searching towards it I don't know about you but I had like two things that taught me about gay sex or the male body well, and the first one was wrestling on a Saturday morning and well, the yeah. second one was the underwear page of the Little Woods catalog. Yes. And like those were the two things I just sort of had and I thought the rest of it I had to figure out. Those Y fronts. Oh. Those those high waisted Y fronts in the Little Wood catalogue. Like yeah. and you'd kind of and you'd and you'd crease the page but then you try and iron it back out. So, so your mod didn't see so you, it, yeah. It's exactly. like so it doesn't fall open at like <laughs> lots of cubes, some page or whatever it is. Yeah. No, I, 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 I we did we did have the Little Woods catalogue. Um we we had another thing which was later on just before I was leaving home which was personal ads so there was oh. a thing called the yellow pages I think it was yeah. um, and uh, like like James I kept birds and so I, I, had, I had budgies not, pi not pigeons did you? but I did yeah, yeah, yeah I did and, and it was interesting because actually that was a way that you could talk w with men they were always really tender with the birds yeah 
So they'd get these birds out and they'd caress them and they would be very soft with them and they'd talk to them in this sort of romantic voice mm -hmm. and, and they would be nice, you know, with you in, in the duke or the aviary or whatever, but then you'd go outside and you just watch them. This armour would come up and the shutters would go down That's and, right, yeah. and that, that would be it. It was, it was a, a complete change. What was I saying just then before you asked me? No, we were talking about tenders and things. Oh, about oh right, so the, the, that, so the reason I said about the budgies is because the, the, the yellow pages had budgies in it. You could buy budgies. Oh. Like, and then, but then at the back one day I turned it and it was like all these, it was like hieroglyphics. It was like VGSOH, VVWE, Gen Sincere, ACDC, uh -huh. Seeks. And I'd be like, fuck this, but mm -hmm. it sounds exciting. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> and so, um, but in the novel, it's 0898 numbers. That's right, yeah. James discovers the 0898 line. Tell That's us right, about yeah. that. yeah. There's a book set that's set before the internet and it's set before email even. And it's a time when, you know, you couldn't be visible, uh, never mind, Section 28, there's the scourge yeah. of age for young, AIDS for young men. It's before the first Pride March in Scotland, uh, before it would really come out of London at all. Mm. And so there's just no visibility. You were, they were hiding themselves. And so the boys use all kinds of ways to connect. And James has figured out that he uses chat lines. And, you know, he, and they're quite innocent, I think, at that time, although some men click in. And so he's calling and he's just talking to people. And actually he talks to a character in one of my New Yorker stories. And so I just made that decision that these are real men to me. And so they connect, even though they don't ever meet in real life. But when I was your age, and I didn't see the yellow pages, but I was forever writing to people in the back of Sky Magazine, it was for me. What was Sky Magazine? Sky Magazine was like a teen magazine. It was right. a very innocent, you know, it had like big Hollywood celebrities and Johnny Depp on the cover. It was like just culture, music and pop. But in the back, it had sort of pen pals, it was really, but it was people mm -hmm. looking for people. and. You know, we think about hookup apps today and how sexual it gets really quickly. It gets it like a market dead fast. But these were so innocent. I mean, I was like Jane Austen writing <laughs> these letters. You know, what is the sky like where you are? You know, <laughs> My, I, re I remember, I like Michelle Pfeiffer. Do you like Michelle Pfeiffer? You know, but I'm like 15, 16. I'm writing to these men. That I'll never meet these other boys. And it did a lot for me just to know somebody was out there and we were yeah. just talking and what's your experience like and what's yours like. And, and I did it for years. I did it all the way till I went to college. So I did did you ever meet any of them? I met some of them. Anything happen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked out. Michelle Pfeiffer did, you, did. did the business. Yeah, I went with my page from the Littlewoods catalog. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> like that. No, I I did it too. I I I I actually I actually put an advert in. I lied about my age and I saved up and sent off and put an advert in. Just like my agent here, I'd like to just say it's my first piece of published work. <laughs> um, and it was a great fiction as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, and I remember getting the replies, but I, I remember also waiting by the letterbox, being absolutely terrified uh -huh. that somebody else would get these replies yeah. before, you know, before I did. But yeah. that never, well, it never happened that I knew of, but I think somebody would have said if they did. But I remember the first time I went and met somebody, he did not look like his picture. Oh, Things yeah. never change. Uh, no. no, but he did, he did not look like his picture, but he did introduce me to ABBA. Well, there you go. So it wasn't so all a loss. It wasn't all a loss. It's know. amazing that we didn't meet, in fact. I just can't believe that we didn't. There will be a yeah. picture somewhere. There will be, yeah. um, But I think you went to cooler clubs than me. I think you went to, did you go to like Club X? I went to so? Club X, only because it was the only one I knew. And Do so you not know Bennett's? I didn't know. I didn't know Bennett's, yeah, I didn't. Um, That's amazing to me. Yeah, I, it was one of the, actually one of the guys Bennett's that I was- like revenge. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It was one of the guys that I met through one of the letters that took me to Club X and then I just thought, oh, I, I know this now. Yeah. So I was in this murky basement with like these big eyes and thinking, God, this is great and terrifying at the same yeah. time. Well, because it was quite mixed Club X, wasn't it? It's where yeah. they had sort of straight nights and gay nights and That's right. bisexual evenings yeah. probably you and know, no like conversation a, like no, no it was too loud for the music the, yeah, the one time yeah, that yeah. i went there i was really scared mm -hmm. then it was more social mm -hmm. um and um there was a big one-armed lesbian on the door called Ginty, <laughs> um, who I thought was a man for the first few years. And, I'd, and the, she never corrected me. She was absolutely lovely. But I remember going there for the first time and being absolutely thrilled and absolutely terrified. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. No, it's shut down. Um, and neither does Club X. I think Kirsten Innes has just written a book apparently about Club X and the yeah. Archies in Glasgow and that whole sort of That's right. that whole sort of scene then. That culture. Yeah, because that was, that was the moment. When did you leave? Glasgow, mm -hmm. 2000. Yeah. Oh no, w uh, about 96 to go to Gala Shields. Right. Yeah. But that's like, what a change that must have been for you to go from Glasgow to Gala Shields. What was that like? Actually, it was mental. I didn't realise that I'd been drawn towards it because, you know, my mum had died when I was 16 and I was living in a bedsit by myself. 
but my entire life had been pretty masculine like because it was a very gendered city at the time mm. you couldn't really hang out with girls you couldn't have platonic friends and I chose Gala Shields I could have gone to Glasgow School of Art but I chose this really small quite provincial textile college in the Scottish borders because it was 16 women to every one man and it was the most uh, it was just the most wonderful experience. I didn't know how much I needed it as a young man uh -huh. to suddenly just like let my shoulders fall from around my ears and take the scowl off my face. And the poor girls that only get one man and I'm the man they get, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they could not get shagged. <laughs> and then, like, but you were like, I've given up pretending it's over, ladies. It's over, it's done, ladies, don't <laughs> yeah. even, yeah. But um, it was actually a brilliant college, but if anybody had a sister that went to that college, if you were their brother, they used to get minivans from Edinburgh, from Glasgow, and fill it with their pals, and then come down to campus oh, on a Saturday night, <laughs> because you were guaranteed in. It was brilliant. It was so good. But um, I loved it. It was four years, and it was a, a wonderful sort of glimpse into a world that maybe men didn't really belong in. Uh -huh. And so it's, it's in, inspired my fiction in many ways. Really? Just to be, yeah, because I always, you know, when I think about Shuggy Bain, I wrote it from quite a feminine perspective, mm -hmm. you know, because it's Shuggy's queer, but then it's Agnes's story. Uh -huh. And everyone in Agnes's world, apart from the men that are uh, loving her or hurting her, uh, everyone's a woman. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to do that because there's been a lot of industrial novels, you know, mm -hmm. James Kelman does it uh, much better than I. But I had always felt like we had never heard the feminine story there, mm -hmm. certainly not the queer story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a tribute to my own mother in many ways, but it was also a tribute to all the women that raised me as a, as a, as a man. I think about that space, I think of Janice Galloway straight mm -hmm. away, who's like the kind of, you know, great poet laureate of, right. of, of, of women there and her memoirs or anti-memoirs, as she mm -hmm. calls them, about her sister and her mother are absolutely incredible I do think she's one of the writers that went before us mm -hmm. to create a space that that's we, right that we could then yep. that we could then be in yep and Agnes Owens as well oh my god I yeah. love Agnes Owens yep. nobody lo I mean she's so not read now I know she's not she's hard to get one of my most treasured things is a signed Agnes Owens book <gasps> that I did you meet her shop in New York no oh. she's been dead for a oh while right, okay. um but it's such a lovely artifact she writes um she her uh actually Watson's here he 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 loves her collective short stories I know and um they they are brilliant and she 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 writes really gothic stories very often about women getting revenge on men. Yeah. There's a great one about that woman who's the witch who makes the uh -huh. she makes a potion or, um, from a barrel into which she has shoved the men that she hates. Yeah. And they decompose <laughs> in this barrel and she creates this hideous potion. And then there's a really creepy short story on a beach uh -huh. in Trun. You know the one with oh, the, the wee boy and the wee that's girl? That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that's making my hair stand on it. Yeah. It's really horrible. Do read it if you can, yeah. She's great. <laughs> yeah. No, but it is horrible, but it is, but it is, it is great. So there are, there, are, there are those people, but I think there aren't many. And certainly when I came to write, I... I Yes, there was the James Kelmans, but they felt like too manly and exactly off-putting for me. I, I exactly felt like that, yeah. I wasn't welcome in that space as a writer. Yeah. Or if it, that's right. And I think, you know, I came to Janice quite late, so mm -hmm. she was someone I didn't discover till later down the road. But I'd felt like people were capturing a lot of Scotland because it was a big male writer mm -hmm. group when we were growing up. You uh, know, that moment mm -hmm. in the 90s was dominated by Irvin and by James and by Alan and by Alistair. And it felt... Very true, but very heterosexual, yeah, and, very. and you know, and very masculine, and and I think it took me a bit of time, but I was trying to write against that, and that's in a funny way why Young Mungo exists as well, because we have a long tradition of like razor gang novels, or mm. you know, I think about Jimmy Boyle's A Sense of Freedom, I think about No Mean City, Graham Armstrong's Amazing, The Young Team, yeah, but I always just thought to myself, there's always like queer men in these in this environment, we just never hear from them, you mm -hmm. know. And that intersection of poverty or working class and queerness is so different to how you know queerness feels in the middle class or the upper middle class. It's mm. just a different, you know this, it's mm. just a different, it's got different consequences, it's got different uh, pressure and, and I just felt I wanted to write about these two men. Well, it's like, you know, it's a world between, you know, the No Mean City and Alan Hollinghurst, isn't yeah. it? Which is like, you know, sort of an, a, a, an acceptable version of, of gay because there's an understanding of architecture and it's, there's North London and yeah. there's fish pie, you know, and it's lovely, you know, but like, you know, it's like... You, you, I, I, that's I, not I, a euphemism. That's, that's not it. a euphemism <laughs> yeah. for Gala Shields. No, it's not. No, no, no. no but, 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 you know, it's like it, you're trying to find a space for yourself yeah. in there. 
And in the end, you don't find the space, you make the space. That's right. You yeah. know, it takes you know? time though. It yeah. definitely, it definitely takes Had time. Had you written Mungo when you'd written, when you'd written Shuggy or did you start? Yeah. Yeah, I did. My thing was, is I'd been writing for a long time. I just didn't know that I would ever be published or that I needed to be. And that sounds, I get what that sounds like now that I've won the booker, but it was really true. I was internalizing a lot of sort of feelings of inadequacy growing up on the real peripheries of sort of books, you know, because they weren't a part of my life as a kid. I didn't study English literature. I didn't know any writers. Mm. And I was with, uh, you know, just a world of fashion design and textile design. In fact, when I wrote Shuggy, I took all my fashion pals. When it was finished, it was just about to be published. I took all my fashion pals out for dinner. And I said, I've, I had to come out. And I said, I've written a book and I'm going to take a break from fashion. And not one of them asked me what the book was about. What? Every single one of them asked me if I got to design the cover. They were like, <laughs> they were desperate to know. They were like, they were desperate to know. And, and it was just, it, so there was a silence in my life there. Uh -huh. But Shuggy took me 10 years to write, but by about the eighth year, it was almost done. Mm. And so my desk is my kitchen table because I, I live in a small apartment. And so it went up to the top of my kitchen table and I started Mungo, but Mungo had been brewing for ages. He was. He kept saying to me, hurry up with that book, hurry up with that other book. Mm. And I came in, I didn't have a plan for Shuggy. I was discovering the story as I wrote it. I was teaching myself my craft. But Mungo came with a plan. Mungo, I would almost could see the whole novel in my mind. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned two characters that are really important to me, but they were the only things that weren't in the book when I sat down to begin well, it. Well, Mrs. Campbell and Chick. That's right, yeah. yeah. And so there's two, Mungo's family comes apart and we do what queer people do. We assemble a chosen family. Yep. And tenements can be oppressive places. They can also be amazing places of community. And there's two neighbors in Mungo's tenement close that looks out for him. One is Mrs. Campbell, who's an elderly woman that lives just below him. And she's so worried about the kids not eating right, so she carries cheese in her penny pocket. And anytime she sees the kids, she takes out two cubes of orange <laughs> cheese. And they're horrified and also delighted to get this sort of like fluffy cheese from this woman. <laughs> but she's caring for them. So it's a very honest gesture of caring. You know, I see you. I know it's hard for you. And I've got you. And then there's a man on Just the... Just before you talk about... Oh, yeah. Did you have a Mrs. Campbell? Hundreds of Mrs. Campbells, oh. actually. I think it's a real, a real part of the Glaswegian culture, you mm. know. And sometimes you get a soggy biscuit, sometimes you get a sweetie that was covered in ooze. Mm. You know, there was always something coming out of pocket though, and it would get thrust at you, and you're just so grateful for it. And mm. it was just a way that people can say to you, I love you, mm -hmm. without being able to say something big and gushy. You know, yeah. it's just like, I see you, I love you. But yeah, but cheese is a lot, because the cheese she gives the kids is sometimes cracked, and they kind of look at it, and she says, you're not going away to eat that, you know, and so they're, like, <laughs> <laughs> they're having to chow it down. It's a lovely kind of collective mothering, the idea that there's a Mrs. Campbell on, on every close, and the thing that you're very good at in yeah. this book particularly is um, giving every person, every character, no matter how minor, mm -hmm. a whole world. Thank they all you. have a world, they all have a story, Thank they all have an interior life, yeah. um, and she's a really, I could read a whole book about Mrs. Campbell, I totally loved her. She's a good egg. You might get to read a wee bit more about her because I think these people feel alive to me uh -huh. and so I don't know where my work's going to go next. But but Campbell's a family surname that's been in both of the books. Uh -huh. I've used it and so there, there might be intersections there in the future. But but yeah, I you know I love that sort of feeling that we had when we grew up where women would mother you. Yeah. And you could say to someone else's kid, stop doing that or come here and you know you could give them a scalp if they needed. But, but Mrs. Campbell's a good character but and let's talk about downstairs. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I've had so many conversations over the past couple of years about what happened to gay men that were pr properly working class, you know, like slaters or shipbuilders in the 40s and 50s, and where did they go? And, of course, you can always be a sexual exile. You can always go to a big capital city or if you can't afford it. But, but so many people, I think, have to stay where they are mm -hmm. and also deal with who they are where they are mm. and i grew up with a lot of bachelors around me and there was always that word always had it was in italics you know what i mean there was yeah. a meaning just under it and mr Cohoon lives on the ground floor of the tenement and the kids are actually told to stay away from him he's a very quiet very you know reserved man but the kids are told to give him a wide berth mm. and there's some slurs scraped on his door and i'd known someone like that i actually once dated a young man in glasgow that that had happened to but anyway, they're told to give him a wide berth because he's a bit suspicious. He's never married. He's always about at the wrong time. He's a paedophile. He's a ped they think, yeah, they, the, the community just says that man's a pedo. And it's horrible because he's known as Mr. Calhoun to his face, but his name is Charles Calhoun. But behind his back, he's called Poor Wee Chicky. And so they both fear him and then they pity him, which is almost worse. Mm. 
And Mungo gets to know him. You know, Mungo's very wary at first, but he gets to know him. And I won't spoil it for you, but he's the most wonderful man. Yeah. And, and he has a whole story and a whole world. And I was thinking about like working class men that, mm. that, you know, that maybe had to stay where they were and, and make a life. And do you conceal yourself? How do you fit in in the community when it can't accept homosexuality? Mm. Mm. He's, um, he's a remarkable character. His life uh, the, in the book doesn't go where I thought it was going to go at all. And he's in very many ways one of the most powerful characters yeah. in terms of the power that he brings to the people around him yeah. um, in the story. Um, again, I could read a whole novel um, or watch a play about him. Um, you mentioned there about uh, having written those those two books and you know it's sort of the famous sort of story of how long it took Shuggy to get published and um, you know that idea of overnight success that of course took 10 years of you at your kitchen table. Your next book, various people have said various things about what it's about. I've heard you know, Weavers and Orkney and this, that and the next. How do you sit down as a writer after that success and after those two books which are a particular very particular place and times not yeah. the same time but times um, how how do you sit down as a writer and do that how do you get into that place again where you can be you as a writer it's, it's really hard and the, the truth is is you know the booker is probably the greatest gift of my career but it comes with burdens mm -hmm. and and so for the past year and a half I've been very much on the surface of my life and 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 unable to get to that sort of deep place where writing has to come from mm. and in many ways I feel like I've got a lot of people in my head that I have to you know it's like a Hogmanay party like the party's over you gotta go yeah. and I've got to like turn the lights on and get them out and and then get back to what I'm, I'm I've got to do but it's been hard and so I'm hoping you know sometime this summer I can sit down and really concentrate but the book's coming together and um, I'm, I'm excited about is it. Is it Orkney? Is it The Weavers? What is it? I you know, I don't... Do you yes. have to talk about it? Do you know well, what? I just don't want to give the magic away because I published uh, this on Thursday, funnily enough, and yes. the very first question that a it's journalist asked me is, yeah. when's your third book out? Oh, thought, no, oh my God, I know it's, like it's totally shite when people do that. It's, it really is. But yeah. what I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about you as a person and yeah. you as a writer and being in that, in that place because I know how hard it can be to get, yeah. to get, to get back there and actually... You know, if you were writing on your own and you never thought it was going to get published, and now it gets, it gets published. And you, have you left fashion completely now? I've left fashion completely. Yeah. The, I mean, the funny thing is, is I left fashion because I wanted to be so present for Shuggy. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to feel like I'd missed an opportunity by saying I was busy or I was working. Mm. And I left fashion, and then Shuggy published in the states, and the reviews were nice. And then two weeks later, the pandemic hit, yeah. and every bookstore closed. And my husband sort of turned to me and said might need to go back to fashion, <laughs> maybe we need to think about getting you a job. And and that's been the gift of the booker, just the ability to like not have to go back there because I really felt like this is what I'd been wanting to do for so many years, I just mm. didn't know how to do it, Damien. Mm. And and so it's I'm very lucky to be able to write. Yeah, and that's it now full time. Are you doing the TV adaptation of Shuggy or not? We, I am, yeah, yeah. I had to think long and hard about that. I was approached to adapt it. We don't yet know if it's going to make the screen, so I'm not trying to, who knows. Until it's on, it's... Until yeah, it's on, it's yeah. not on. Yeah, you're yeah. on telly, you know this, yeah. But I wasn't sure I wanted to go back and spend more time with Agnes and Shuggy after 12 years with them. Mm -hmm. And what happened was mm -hmm. I was thinking that there's people in my community, there's people in my family that haven't read Shuggy and never will. Mm -hmm. And telly was so important to me as a kid. It was how I got all my culture. Mm -hmm. It's how I learned about storytelling. It's how I learned about the world. And I felt a responsibility to Shuggy and Agnes. But the book is finished, and you would think adapting it for screen should be pretty straightforward. But when the medium changes, the story has to change. Yeah. And when the story changes, Agnes is like, hold on a minute, <laughs> she's got more things to tell you. And sometimes I sit there and I'm like, you can't say that, it's not what you said in the book. <laughs> and she's like, it doesn't matter, just <laughs> get it on you go. Get it on with it. Get it on with it, yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a struggle to get her to stop talking. Um, I could hear her all day. She's absolutely brilliant. She's that Elizabeth Taylor from the Barras, you know. It's just total glamour, and I love her. I'm w working on an adaptation, just a TV adaptation, just out of Maggie. Yeah, and me. Yeah. It's really interesting to to take apart the story yeah. um, and to think, you know, what what can be different about telly? Because it's going to talk to a whole different group of people. That's right. With a whole different set of expectations. Yep. Um, so you can do something different, but at the same time, be, you don't want people who are watching it who've read the book to go that didn't happen because there's nothing worse than that. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there is that tension. Or I remember to spoil your book. Yeah, you don't want to spoil like there's it. There's so much no. pressure. Yeah. I would rather the book existed than the TV. That's right. Yeah. Um, always, always the book, not the telly. So, yeah. 
I remember interviewing Louis de Bernier about Captain Corelli's mandolin and he practically bit my face off. He was like, don't ask me about it, Nicolas yeah. Cage, fuck! You yeah. Know? <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was a shit film, but it was a great film. It was. <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> it was. It was. Um, okay, time for your questions before I get even more carried away. Questions from the audience. And there's a microphone which will be making its way around, so hopefully you've had some time to think about uh, what you want to ask. I just sort of spine that. Are you up in the front row here? Oh, and is there somebody at the back as well? I can't see. The back row sitting there like that. It's not the usual suspects. You don't need to look so scared. Oh, there you go. Here you go. Question at the front. This is the lovely Inga from City Books, Hello. everybody. <laughs> She's a star, Inga. local star. And your book during lockdown was a gift. And it's I've hand sold it because it was my favourite book of the year. Oh, and I was so thrilled, you know, because we were able to read it before it came out. That's yeah. one of the joys of being a bookseller. And like Damien, I just knew it had legs and it was gonna do well. So thank you. As a bookseller, thank you. Thank you. Um, what is the community like now? Because we've we now we know what it's like when you were growing up. What is it like now? Are you aware of any changes? Is it still, you know, is it still a horrific thing to be gay in in the areas now? Has it changed? I, we should ask the people from Glasgow right next to you. They should. Uh, but uh, but no, you answer first. Go first. I'll, I have something to say about that. But go. Yeah. I think it's utterly changed, yeah. um, and I think that's a good thing. Glasgow was actually just voted the eighth best place in the world to be gay or to visit as a gay person. Edinburgh wasn't in the top ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Sorry, too much joy with that. <laughs> but, but, but it was. But one of the things that I was thinking, I was thinking about when I was writing this story is how quickly gay rights has moved on and our experience. And, I think we have a full spectrum of queer voices now that are often optimistic or uh, you know, polyphonic. There's all of these different things, but we're really quick sometimes to forget our history mm. um, or to move beyond it. And like I said, I think queer history from a place of poverty or working class was very different to what is in most literature. Um, and so, yes, it's much better. In fact, it's night and day, but it was rough. I did a, a walking tour when I was in Glasgow uh, last year of um, never do a walking tour in Glasgow. It just rained the whole time. <laughs> we walked over the Clyde and I was like, I might as well actually throw myself in. Yeah. This might be drier. But we did this queer walking tour and um, and it taught me so much about the queer history of the city that, uh -huh. I, that I didn't know. Um, stuff that I sort of dimly gleaned from older men who I was uh -huh. a bit scared of when I first went out onto the scene and yeah. who I now wish that I'd been brave enough to talk to That's or not okay. prejudiced enough to talk to, let's be yeah. honest. But um, but you know we, we but you know the history of you know decriminalisation happening much later in Scotland and I sort of think and it remind it makes me think of Ireland it's like we're going further faster mm -hmm. and um, you know not that long ago the three out of the four main political parties had queer leaders in Scotland who were out they weren't just like oh she's a bit you know look at that you know mm -hmm. he's that it was like they were out and they talked about their lives they talked about That's their right. families yeah. you know and I, and I just sort of thought that was incredible I don't live there. Um, uh, that might change, but you know, I moved. I moved here because I was what you described earlier as a sort of exile. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I came here to, to be me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and you went to New York. I went to, to New York, York. Yeah, to be you. Yeah, and found that anonymity there that I didn't have as a young man in Glasgow. Yeah, and it, you know, I think when I came out, it was my family weren't disappointed in me. They were disappointed for me, which uh -huh. was the thing because they thought I was inheriting a really hard world. Uh, because it was hard and you know mm. this is 1994, 1993 and they just knew that my life was going to be much harder than theirs and so they were really upset for me not in yeah. me um, and that was fascinating I had to like unpack that a lot as a young man you know because it was I guess we were all complicit in that society I get into trouble a lot because I talk about homophobia and I say I don't know that everybody that was homophobic when I was younger was a bad person I think the vast majority of them were good people I just don't think society had taught them another way to be mm. um, and I get a lot of eyebrows at that but I do yeah, believe yeah, that yeah. I think there was really bad people that were homophobic and colossal bigots and really violent people yeah were once almost killed by 12 lads so it was it was bad mm. but I don't think everybody was I just think you know they didn't know how to well, accept queer culture. You know, being gay is natural, being homophobic is learned. 
Um, and um, and I, I remember my mum saying to me exactly what you just described. Yeah. I don't want this for you. That's right. And it's like, what you don't want for me is not being gay because there's no template for gay and happy. There's mm-hmm. own, mm-hmm. What you don't want for me is homophobia. Yeah. And you're complicit that's in it. that by saying that's what I don't want for you. So, yeah. um, but I do, I do, I do, my experience of going back there, and I've been back there a lot, back to Scotland, a lot, back to Glasgow a lot, is that it has changed, you know, beyond, beyond, beyond recognition but that's not to say it's easy and straightforward and there's a huge amount of prejudice right now against trans people yeah. and you know there's a lot of that happening everywhere but particularly in, in the it seems to me a wee bit of the west coast of scotland right now but but um you know i don't know i'm not i feel like we should definitely hear from the people you can answer this question at length in the bar later <laughs> um we'd like that any other question oh there's somebody in the okay there you go from i recognize that man it's lovely stephen short I don't know everybody in Brighton, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here anymore. I know you fucked off the hate things. Um, I'd like to know what you think your mum would think of your book. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. It's pure speculation because I guess I'll never know, but my family are very proud of the book. And I think part of the thing that led my mother to drinking heavily was she felt very overlooked. People didn't like. People don't like to look at women that have addiction, mm. and they feel very alone and very isolated. And you know, almost everything in my community could fail until a mother failed, and then oh boy, were you in trouble? And I think my mum would just be proud. I think she'd be over the moon that her story that nobody wanted to reckon with or deal with um, would has inspired this this work of fiction. So I mean, m- mums are proud of their sons anyway, you know. But I think my mum would would wear it with a sense of pride. Um, I do, I think that. How you feel about that's changed? Oh, not that particular thing, but your mum's pride, but how you feel about talking about your mum having inspired things? Because I remember when we talked earlier on, um, we were talking about the, the links between memoir and fiction and yeah. the sense that you know, you're know you writing fiction, but your feet, your feet are in your life. It's where we all are. We can't, right, yeah. can't any of us be anywhere else. That's not you or, or me. That's, that's where you are that as, a, as, a, as a writer. But to, be, to begin with, there was definitely a sense I felt from you of caution mm-hmm. about that. And that, I've watched that change, and particularly with this book, it's, it's night and day. How, how's that? Yeah, it, it wasn't something I wanted to do, so you're totally right. I, you know, when I first published the book, a journalist would ask me, how much of Shuggy Bain has inspired your life? And I, oh, it's totally a work of fiction, you know? I don't know. Here I am in New York, and I don't, yeah, I just dreamt up those characters. And I did that for about five, six months, up until it published in the UK. And for any of you that have got something in your life that you didn't want to share or you felt shamed about, you'll know how exhausting it is to conceal it all the time. Mm. For me, it was my queerness when I was a young man. It was the poverty, it was the addiction. And you don't know the stories you're telling people because you can't keep it straight, and so you're just lying. Mm -hmm. And so I started in a very small way, just say, you know, very basic facts, but journalists are fascinating because you love to shove your finger in a crack, I've heard. (laughs) And once it gets in there, it just goes like this, and they rip it asunder. (laughs) And uh, we've heard, (laughs) depends what kind. and so I just started with a bear, but then it opened. And there was a period where it just felt super liberating, right? Yeah. It just felt, okay, here it is. Here's my authentic story. This is what it is. And, and I realized I've been t- not telling people, even people that I know, people that are my friends, mm. people that I went to college with, people that I worked with, people that are very close to me, they didn't know the whole of me. And so Shuggy liberated me in a weird way mm. um, to be able to say stuff. Something that came out of the book that I didn't even realize until about a year ago is, you know, my family turned to me a couple of months after the book published and we were just chatting one day and my sister turned to me and said, were you bullied like Shuggy was bullied at school? And I went, oh my God, oh yeah, and worse, I said. And when I was a kid, the rejection of gay people was complete. There was nowhere to turn to. I don't need to explain this to you. Mm-hmm. You just, like, you couldn't turn to a teacher, you couldn't turn to someone in your community. And, and so when I was being bullied at school, I wouldn't bring it home and tell my family. I wouldn't even just say I was having a tough time because I was so fearful my family say, why are they bullying you? Mm. Bullying me because they say I'm gay. Mm. Are you gay? I don't know. And then they would also reject me. Now my family never would, I don't think my family would have. But I forgot that I just hadn't told them that about my thing and my mm. sister was devastated. When uh, you say that you didn't, um share that full sense of yourself mm-hmm. with with people was that bec- was that in the sense that you were afraid that they would reject you was it about shame was it or was it just about i just want to be done with that what what what, what did you think it was about and what was it about i think a lot of it's about being british 
Mm. Um, and I think we, we tell kids that grow up in poverty or in the working class or have a tough time that that's not something we want to look at as a mm. society. And mm. even when I was young, you know, we were proud to be working class, but we were really ashamed to be poor. Yeah. And that was where my mother's oversized sense of pride came from, right? It's, it's, a, it's a real superpower, but it also masks something really sad. Uh. And then addiction, something that you're not encouraged to talk about. I think anybody, and there'll be people in this audience because my readers often have gone through it, that suffers with addiction is sometimes we try and keep it at home, especially when it's a mother, especially when reputations are involved. Mm. And so I was always, and then my m being gay, and so there was, I was always this very compartmentalized young person and I was never allowed to show myself entirely. And so whenever I went into a room, there was always a fast, there was like, I was turning to like, meet the thing of the person to conceal the thing behind me mm. and it's exhausting right because yeah. you just want to be sometimes and part of becoming an adult part of writing Shuggy Bane was about trying to reclaim that for myself mm. because actually so many of us have one of more of those things and there is no shame in any of it but I was taught I was internalized from the minute I could you know was five years old that I should be ashamed about those things about being effeminate about being poor about oh your mommy drinks too much mm. Um, so y y that's right. That's the lesson that Shuggy writing Shuggy taught you. And every book we write tells us a lesson. It's not necessarily the lesson we think it's going to be. It's not what we we think it is at the time. And often it's our readers who tell us. So what is it that you think so far that that Mungo has has taught you, or has given you? Mungo has reinforced for me how f lonely I was as a young man because you know they have a pretty beautiful love story at the heart of the book, and I think I wrote it as some kind of wish fulfillment mm. for myself. I would have loved, you know to have met another young gay man, to have friends. I'd love to have met you love when we were growing you. up, but I just didn't. And so, I, you know, those years from 13 to 17 were so lonely. Mm. And not just lonely in the fact that I didn't have a friend, I just didn't know other gay men existed in that way, you know? Stay up and watch Channel 4 past the watershed and you're like, they're out there somewhere. Yeah. They're, you know, you know. They're all on Channel 4, that's, I the, know. that's the, that the, the, you know. I know, I, w I wonder how many like 14 year old lads in working class places became like connoisseurs of Derek Jarman, you know, with no, <laughs> with no understanding of fine cinema, but you're like, <coughs> oh my God, you it's know. Like, yeah, totally. Yeah, I couldn't tell, yeah, I had no idea what was going on, but you'd wait for the nudie bits. Of course, um, you know, you're watching for a bum or, you know. Yeah, or for a bum, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, I think it's reminded me how lonely I was yeah. and I hadn't quite reckoned with that. Yeah. Be interesting to see what other gifts it gives you. What other what other things you get when that idea that you know the reader completes a book. Now you're on tour. You get to meet your readers and you get to you get to hear their stories as well. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. And they get to see my legs. Nobody's <laughs> seen my legs before. That's last true because you were just about you were always on disembodied like that. head yeah, on yeah. that white couch. Yeah. Are you getting a new couch in case you have to do more <laughs> for, that, for that book of mine? Uh, uh, well, maybe we'll see. Yeah. Um, there will be no gays on Channel Four after Nadine Dorrit is privatised. It's just so we're really clear. We're, yeah. we're so going to have to find can. somewhere new to like BBC Two. Maybe we'll all move yeah. there or something like That's that. That's right. Um, other <laughs> other questions? Uh, yes, hiya. All right. Hiya. Um, so the passage you read, yeah. Yeah. it seems like the very first time that passage in particular comes out which is the sort of key thing. Yeah. Um, Sorry, it, it reminded me, the passage, so to repeat what I was saying, the passage you read, the very kind of tender scene, I'm afraid to say it reminded me of a beautiful thing. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're a fan or not. Huge fan. And that takes me back to when I was growing up in Scotland mm -hmm. and being gay, one of the first things that I saw was beautiful thing and yeah. it really kind of spoke to me and I was in floods of tears watching it. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about relationship with my mother who's to my right, even though <laughs> we, we don't have a volatile relationship like that. But I was very curious, just your last point about lack of cultural references. Uh -huh. What else spoke to you mm -hmm. in terms of books and um, films at the time growing up in the 80s and the 90s? Because I know from my own personal experience, there was a lack, so you hung on to absolutely anything. Anything, yeah. You know, I have to say, I didn't have a huge amount of like queer touch points when I was a kid. Mm. I didn't, I, I think about this a lot and I couldn't, it really was for me when I was about 15 and you got the channel four and it came on after, you know, after 11 o'clock at night. And I remember being about 17 and going in and like rummaging through the gay section in the bookstore in the Waterstones. And that was for me what opened, what started to open it up. But I was always so fearful that someone would find something at home or that it would be, exposed and I'm not sure you know for me I remember the feeling of whenever you saw someone gay on telly as a kid I wasn't quite sure if we were laughing with them or laughing at them I came up in the time where all the comedians were very effeminate and very fey and they were wonderful men wonderful mm. comedians 
but the family around me were sort of like, oh, you know, it was a bit like that. And, and you know, I remember viscerally whenever George, you know, Boy George was there or when Freddie Mercury was outed and how it was so tied to death and mm. how the newspaper would write the word bender on the front cover and there would be no recrimination for it and you internalize all that as a kid. So I'm not answering your question about influences or culture because that came to me much later. Mm. But I love Jonathan Harvey. I love everything he does, whether that's a beautiful thing or gimme, gimme, gimme. Um, I wish I was as tender as he is. Mm. You're, you're about to find out when you read the book. I'm not. Mm. Um, but I love that movie. Uh, yeah, um, I remember I remember that movie too, actually. Um, but I didn't see it until later. I think I saw it at university. I remember um, this in Young Monkey, you have this brilliant scene where the two boys are watching a comic. And the very first thing they say, of course, he's an English comic, and English comics are notoriously unfunny. Yeah. Um, and then, but then he's camp, and then they're, yeah. and then they kind of join in laughing with him, and that's yeah. that sort of internalized homophobia, that shame, this that's idea right, yeah. that you know that it's not something to be admired or respected. Yeah. I remember the Lost Language of the Cranes. I don't know if anybody remembers that TV adaptation that I watched late at night with the volume down. Don't know what they said, but they looked great. Um, and um, I remember also reading a boy's own story. Oh, wow. um, Edmund White, which I went, I got a bus to Motherwell Library, so I didn't get it out of my local library, so the librarian didn't know I was getting a gay book out. Amazing. Um, so yeah, I went all the way and read that, and that was quite a transformative experience. And that, that book actually is being out brought out as a graphic novel later this mm. year, I just read the other day. So Amazing. anyway, be interesting. I think now if you ask somebody now who, had been, who was in their 20s, they'd be like sitting for you know 40 minutes going, and then there was this and there was that, and it's like, I'm so old, they're remaking Queer as Folk. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like I remember that the rimming. Um, <laughs> question. <laughs> Everybody remembers the rimming. Yeah. Hiya. Wait for the microphone, will you? Can we have a microphone over here, please? Or are you going to pass it over? Thank you. Um, just on the topic of like media. Yeah. It's like a light-hearted one. Um, you mentioned um like adapting Shaggy Bang for screen. Yeah. Um, if. Yeah, if you've ever thought of like an actor in mind, like oh. dead, live, whatever, yeah. or yeah, the characters. Oh, you know, that's a brilliant question. You'd get me run out of town if I answered that honestly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'd be just choose all dead ones and then. You oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, she, it's going to be a hard actress to do it because she has to be Scottish. She has to understand the milieu, but she also has to be. I mean, it's quite a role for a for an actress, I think, because she's imperious. She's strong. She's defiant. And then she disintegrates entirely and she becomes quite vulnerable and someone that you just want to look after. And so it'll be, I don't know, we haven't met her yet and we don't, we, I'm not trying to conceal it, but I think it's going to be really fun to find who Shuggy is. Funnily enough, uh, Alan Cumming was one of the very first people that read Shuggy Bane and he said to me when he read it, I have to play Shuggy. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Al Alan? <laughs> and uh, I said, Alan, he's only 14. And, and, and he goes, he thinks about it for a minute. He goes, then I'll play Agnes. <laughs> and I thought, now you're talking. I like Agnes, would I like that? I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who do you think? Did you have anybody yeah. in mind when you asked the question? Yeah. 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 Well, you telling me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If we could get Liz Taylor back, it would be great. She would be great. Liz Taylor would be great. Great. She would absolutely. Can you imagine her with a Glaswegian accent? Oh, though? I can. I just yeah. think it would be the best ever. Are you running the messages? <laughs> yeah, it would be brilliant. Is that some bucket? <laughs> kind of, she'd be, no, she would be amazing. Um, other questions, please. And we've got time for one more. Yeah, there you are. Second row there. There you are. Thank you, and um, yeah, thanks, Douglas, for Shuggy Bain. I, I read it in a day, and I was oh, just wow. in bits by the end of it, and I can't remember when I last read a book like that, so it was, it was really you. powerful. Um, but I'd just really like to know what are the books that you really love yeah. and, and why? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for reading Shuggy in, in a day. That must have been a journey. Um, <laughs> yeah. Books that I love and why. I came to books late in life, um, and so I don't have that formative thing that ki some kids have that say, that's the book for me. Mm. But there's loads, and I'm still discovering them. I love, above everything else, Thomas Hardy's Tess of the Durbervilles and Jude the Obscure. And there's a little bit of Agnes and Tess, and there's a little bit of Leek in Jude, mm. so thank you, Thomas. Um, I love Alan Warner's Morvan Caller, um, because I think it's one of the most uh, direct, 
books that I've ever read. I love how he celebrates language. I love how it feels like poetry. I really empathise with Morvan. I, I never I never judge her. I love Cormac McCarthy, just about everything he does. All the pretty horses. I even love the horror of Child of God. Um, I love Toni Morrison, but Paradise and Beloved. Mm. Everyone always overlooks that Toni Morrison actually is a writer of violence. Mm. Right? We think about her as intimate, but the first line in, um, in Paradise, is, I think, is they killed the white girl first. Mm. And when you can like start with that, you know, that's, that's quite powerful. Um, I love Alan Hollinghurst, um, although I often think I'm writing against his grain or I'm in conversation with him because I felt, you know, I wanted to address class. Um, and who else? Agnes Owens we spoke about. There's, there's so, so many. Right now, I can't get over how talented Claire Keegan is. Um, and Foster or Antarctica or small mm -hmm. things like these. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so many. So many. And Damien Barr. Sorry. <laughs> you, get, you get me booted out. Uh, thank you very much. They're all available to buy from Inga uh, at her bookshop yeah. out there. So anyway, um, I just want to say thank you so much thank for you. being here tonight, for coming and opening your heart and sharing the book and making us the end of your tour. Um, it's been an incredible night. And we didn't meet then, but we met on the page, and I'm grateful for that. So please join me in thanking Douglas Stewart. Thank you. <laughs> Wasn't that just wonderful? Thank you so much for listening to our evening with Douglas. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we and our lovely Brighton audience did. If you'd like to pick up a copy of Young Mungo, it's available now from your local indie, of course, or you can support the podcast by buying a copy through the Literary Salon Shop on bookshop.org. As always, thanks for listening and join us again soon. Mm -hmm.